Eternal life is a free gift from God. Jesus died for you at Calvary. He is the way, the truth, the life, the door. If you believe in him, you shall be saved. God's God's free gift to you is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. Greetings to all my friends on Facebook, WhatsApp and all my internet family around the world. And whether you are watching us live at this time or watching a recording on Facebook, on YouTube or any other social media sites, I want to greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ and welcome you to our Victory in Truth broadcast. We are going today to do some teaching. I'm not in preaching mode. I'm going to be in teaching mode and I hope that what we are going to teach on today will help you, encourage you and edify you. We are going to be speaking on the ten gates of Jerusalem. The ten gates of Jerusalem. But before we do that, we want to read Nehemiah chapter 3. So I hope you've got your with you or you can just watch the text on your screen as we read Nehemiah chapter 3 and look at the gates that are mentioned in this, cha in this chapter. Chapter 3. Then Eliashib the high priest rose up with his brethren the priests and they built the sheep gate. They sanctified it and set up the doors of it. Even unto the tower of Mia they sanctified it unto the tower of Hananiel. And next unto him builded the men of Jericho and next to them builded Zachar the son of Imri. But the fish gate did the sons of Hassaneah build, who also laid the beams thereof, and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. And next unto them repaired Merimoth the son of Urijah the son of Koz, and next unto them repaired Meshullam the son of Berechiah the son of Meshezabil, and next unto them repaired Zadok the son of Baan, and next unto them the Tekoites repaired but their nobles put not their necks to the work of their lord. Moreover, the old gate repaired Jehoiada the son of Pasea and Meshullam the son of Besodiah. They laid the beams thereof and set up the doors thereof and the locks thereof and the bars thereof. And next unto them repaired Melatiah the Gibeonite and Jadon the Moronothite, the men of Gibeon and of Mizpah, unto the throne of the governor on this side the river. Next unto him repaired Uzziel the son of Harhiah of the goldsmiths. Next unto him also repaired Hananiah the son of one of the apothecaries. And they fortified Jerusalem unto the broad wall. And next unto them repaired Rephiah the son of Hur, the ruler of the half part of Jerusalem. And next unto them repaired Jediah the son of Harumath, even over against his house. And next unto him repaired Hattush the son of Hashabniah. Malchijah the son of Herim and Hashab the son of Pehath Moab repaired the other piece and the tower of the furnaces. And next unto him repaired Shalom the son of Halohesh, the ruler of the half part of Jerusalem, he and his daughters. The valley gate repaired Hanan and the inhabitants of Zanoah. They built it and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof, and a thousand cubits on the wall unto the dung gate. But the dung gate repaired Malchiah the son of Rechab, the ruler of part of beth Hakarim. He built it and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. But the gate of the fountain repaired Shalom, the son of Kolhosi, the ruler of part of Mizpah. He built it and covered it, and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof, and the wall of the pool of Siloah by the king's garden, and unto the stairs that go down from the city of David. After him repaired Nehemiah the son of Azbuk, the ruler of the half part of Beth Zer, unto the place over against the sepulchres of David, and to the pool that was made, and unto the house of the mighty. After him repaired the Levites, Rehum the son of Bani, 
Next unto him repaired Hashabiah, the ruler of the half part of Keilah, in his part. After him repaired their brethren, Bevei, the son of Hanadad, the ruler of the half part of Keilah. And next to him repaired Ezer, the son of Jeshua, the ruler of Mizpah, another piece over against the going up to the armory at the turning of the wall. After him, Baruch, the son of Zabai, earnestly repaired the other piece from the turning of the wall unto the door of the house of Eliashib, the high priest. After him repaired Merimoth, the son of Uridah, the son of Koz, another piece from the door of the house of Eliashib even to the end of the house of Eliashib. And after him repaired the priests, the men of the plain. After him repaired Benjamin and Hashab over against their house. After him repaired Azariah, the son of Maasiah, the son of Ananiah, by his house. After him repaired Binuai, the son of Hanadad, another piece, from the house of Azariah unto the turning of the wall, even unto the corner. Pelal, the son of Uzai, over against the turning of the wall, and the tower which lieth out from the king's high house, that was by the court of the prison. After him, Pediah the son of Perosh. Moreover, the Nethinims dwelt in Ophel unto the place over against the water gate toward the east and the tower that lieth out. After them, the Tekoites repaired another piece over against the great tower that lieth out even unto the wall of Ophel. From above the horse gate repaired the priests, every one over against his house. After them repaired Zadok the son of Immer over against his house. After him repaired also Shemaiah the son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate. After him repaired Hananiah the son of Shelemiah, and Hanan the sixth son of Zalaph, another piece. After him repaired Meshullam the son of Berechiah over against his chamber. After him repaired Malchiah the goldsmith's son unto the place of the Nethinims and of the merchants, over against the gate Mithcad, and to the going up of the corner. And between the going up of the corner unto the sheep gate repaired the goldsmiths and the merchants. We are talking about the ten gates of Jerusalem. There are ten gates that are mentioned in the book of Nehemiah. And let me just put them on there for you. They are the sheep's gate, the fish gate, the old gate, the valley gate, the dung gate, the fountain gate, the water gate, the horse gate, the heath gate, the inspection gate. And each one of these has significant meaning. But before we go into the significance of the gates, we need to look at the background. We need to go back some 150 years before the events found in the book of Nehemiah. Because of the foolish decision of Solomon's son, Rehoboam, and you can read this in 1 Kings chapter 12, the tribes of Israel were split into two kingdoms. They were the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. All the kings of the northern kingdom rejected Jehovah, Yahweh God, and they worshipped the false gods of the other nations that were round about them, that they were told not to do it. They were only to worship Jehovah, Yahweh God, and only him should they worship. But they rejected God. And because of the northern kingdom's rejection, God led them into captivity. Let me tell you, friends, rebellion always leads to bondage. And they were led into captivity by the Assyrian nation. However, the southern kingdom, they had a few good kings, some very faithful kings. But the majority of the southern kingdom's kings were evil, wicked, and rejected God. And led the people into idolatry and into practices that were contrary to the will of God. And God led them also into captivity, but not by the Assyrian nation, but by the Babylonian nation. Under Nebuchadnezzar, they were taken captive. God had determined beforehand that the northern tribes would be 
led into captivity for 70 years as a punishment that they might return to the true and living God. After the captivity, the children of Israel were allowed to return and build the temple. And later on, under Nehemiah, they were allowed to build the walls. But we're going to play a video that explains the background because it's important that you understand the background of what we are teaching on here today. So just watch this video and please make some notes. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah. In most modern Bibles, these books are separate, but that division happened long after it was written. It was originally a unified work written by a single author. The story is set after the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and its temple and took many of the people into exile. And this book picks up about 50 years later and tells the return of some Israelites to Jerusalem and then what happened when they rebuilt the city and their lives there. Specifically, the book focuses on three key leaders who led the rebuilding efforts. You have Zerubbabel, then Ezra, and then Nehemiah. And the book's design focuses on the efforts of each leader. Zerubbabel leads a large group of people back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Then about 60 years later, Ezra arrives in Jerusalem to teach the Torah and rebuild the community. And then he's followed by Nehemiah, who leads the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls. And these three stories are designed to be parallel. Each begins with the king of Persia prompted by God to send the leader to Jerusalem and he offers resources and support and then each leader encounters opposition in their efforts which they then overcome but in a way that leads to a strange anticlimax in each of the three parts. Let's back up and see how it fits together. So the story begins with a decree from Cyrus, the king of Persia, and he's moved by God to allow the exiles to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And the author says this fulfills a promise made by the prophet Jeremiah that the exiles would one day return to Jerusalem. Now, this fulfillment should trigger our hopes in the many other prophetic promises that exile was not the end of the story. We have hope for a future messianic king from the line of David. We have hope for a rebuilt temple where God's presence will dwell with his people. Hope for God's kingdom to come over all the nations and bring his blessing, just like he promised Abraham. And so it's with all these hopes in mind that we read on into the story of Zerubbabel. His name means planted in Babylon. He represents the generation born in Babylonian captivity, and he leads a wave of Israelites returning to Jerusalem. After they settle there, they rebuild the altar for offering sacrifices, and later the temple itself. The foundation laying ceremony, and then the temple's final dedication, these are key moments. The past stories of the tabernacle and temple's dedication should be in our minds. This is when the fiery cloud of God's presence is supposed to descend. He's dwelling with his people, and it doesn't happen. And so while some people are happy about this new temple, the elders who had seen the previous temple of Solomon, they cry out in grief. It is nothing like their glorious past or their hopes for the future. And it's right here that we get the first story of opposition, and it's very odd. So the grandchildren of the Israelites who were not taken into exile, they had been living in Jerusalem all along, they come to offer help with the temple rebuilding. And Zerubbabel refuses. He says, you have no part in our temple. And this, of course, generates a conflict which Zerubbabel overcomes, but it's very strange because the prophets had envisioned that the tribes of Israel would all come together along with all of the nations to participate in the worship of the God of Israel when the kingdom finally comes. So this is an anticlimactic moment to say the least. In the next section, we zoom forward about 60 years and we're introduced to Ezra. He's a leader among the exiled Israelites in Babylon. And he's a Torah scholar and a teacher. And so he gets appointed by Artaxerxes, king of Persia, to lead another wave of people back to Jerusalem. And Ezra wants to bring about spiritual and social renewal among the people. Our hopes are high. And again, we come to another anticlimactic moment in the story. Ezra learns that many of the exiled Israelites that had come back, they had married non-exiles who had been living around Jerusalem. Some of them were non-Israelites, and almost certainly some of them were. 
Ezra then appeals to the commands of the Torah that Israel was supposed to be holy and separate from the ancient Canaanites. And he then says that the people living around Jerusalem are like the Canaanites. They're going to corrupt the exiles. So Ezra offers a prayer of repentance, and it's very heartfelt. But then he rallies all the leaders and enacts this divorce decree that says all these marriages should be annulled, the women and children sent away. And then the decree is only partially carried out. We're given a list of some of the men who divorced their wives. The story is very strange for a number of reasons. First of all, God never commanded Ezra to do any of this. It was the leaders of Jerusalem who led Ezra to make the decree. Second, the contemporary prophet Malachi, he did say that the exiles should care about purity, but he also said that God was opposed to divorce. And so the mixed results of the decree, this all fits into this pattern of a strange concluding anticlimax. Which leads us to the next section about Nehemiah. He's an Israelite official serving in the Persian government, and when he hears about the ruined state of Jerusalem's walls, he prays and then gets permission from the Persian king Artaxerxes to go and rebuild the walls. The king even gives him an armed escort and all these resources. So after arriving in Jerusalem, he begins the building project, and he too faces opposition from the people who had already been living around Jerusalem. Once again, we face a tension in the story. The contemporary prophet Zechariah said that the new Jerusalem of God's kingdom would be a city without walls, that God's presence would surround it, that people from all nations would come and join the covenant people. But Nehemiah seems to operate with the opposite vision. He informs the people surrounding Jerusalem that they have no part in Jerusalem. And this, of course, provokes them to hostility. And so while Nehemiah carries out his vision for the city with integrity and courage. They have to build the city with armed guards to protect them. We keep wondering, could this whole conflict have been handled differently? And this all leads to the conclusion of the book in two movements, first positive and then negative. Ezra and Nehemiah combine forces to bring about a spiritual renewal among the people. They gather all the exiles together for a festival. They read and teach the Torah to all the people for seven days. And then they celebrate the ancient Feast of Tabernacles to remember God's faithfulness from the Exodus and the wilderness journeys. Then they offer a confession of their sins. They vow themselves to renew the covenant, follow all the commands of the Torah. And they finish with a great celebration over the temple, the walls of Jerusalem, and we're thinking, thinking this could be the turning point, but it's not. The book ends on a huge downer. Nehemiah tours around the city, and he finds that the people have not been fulfilling their covenant vows. So Zerubbabel's work is undone as he finds the temple being neglected and staffed by all these unqualified people. He then discovers that Ezra's work is being compromised. He finds everyone violating the Torah, people are working on the Sabbath, and even his own work on the walls is involved because people are setting up markets around the walls of Jerusalem and working on the Sabbath. So Nehemiah, he goes on a rampage. He's beating people up, he's pulling out their hair, and he's yelling, Obey the commands of the Torah. And his final words are a prayer that God would remember him, that at least he tried, and the book ends. I mean, it's very strange. But we've been prepared for it, right? These anticlimactic moments have been woven into the book's design intentionally. And so it raises the question, what on earth does this book contribute to the storyline of the Bible? Well, remember, the book started by raising our hopes in the prophetic promises about the Messiah, the temple, the kingdom of God, and then none of it happens. So even though Israel is now back in the land, their spiritual state seems unchanged from before the exile. And while Ezra and Nehemiah, they do their best, but their political and social reforms among the people don't address the core issues of their heart. So what the book is pointing out is the same need highlighted by the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel. What God's people need is a holistic transformation of their hearts if they're ever going to love and obey their God. And so the book ends on a downer, yes, but it forces you to keep reading on into the wisdom and prophetic books to find out what is God going to do to fulfill his great covenant promises. But for now, that's the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. Well, I hope you learned a lot from that video. It's the background because we are talking about the Ten Gates of Jerusalem, which is found in the book of Nehemiah. We shall continue that in the next edition, but this is an introduction, and it's important that you understand the background of what led 
to the walls and the gates being built. We are not teaching the book of Nehemiah, but it's important for you to know the background. And in our next lesson, we're going to start talking about the various gates that are mentioned in the book of Nehemiah. And there are significant things that you and I can learn from that will bring us into a closer relationship with the Lord, help us to understand the Bible better and help us to grow into men and women of God. In the book of Nehemiah, we find the temple had been built, the walls of Jerusalem were still down, leaving them defenseless. They had a wonderful temple. It had been built. They'd gone to worship and praise God. But the walls of Jerusalem were still down. And because the walls were down, it led to them living in despair, open to the attack of the enemy. Not much is said about what happened to the people in Jerusalem in the book of Nehemiah. But there is a record that is found in Josephus, the Jewish historian, and this is what Josephus wrote about the conditions at the time when the walls were down, but the temple was built. This is what Josephus said. Jo jo Josephus, the Jewish historian, gives us a lot more detail. He says, they replied they were in a bad state, for the walls were thrown down to the ground. And the neighbouring nations did a great deal of mischief to the Jews. While it was daytime, they overran and pillaged it. And in the night they did mischief, insomuch that not a few were led away captives out of the country and out of Jerusalem itself, and that the roads in the day were filled with dead men. This is what happened. The oh, they had a temple. They were worshipping God. This is what I believe is important, friends, that you and I learn a lot from the book of Nehemiah. And one day I will go into the book of Nehemiah. But in these lessons, I'm concentrating on the gate. But there is an important lesson that we want to learn as I round up today's lesson, which is just an introduction. And it's important that the walls of our life are built up. Take a look at what was happening. They had a place to worship. The temple was built. They would come into the temple, worship their living God. But outside, the place was in a mess. And what had happened was, the people were allowed to come in, pillage. They'd take what they wanted. They overran the country. They took people slaves. They took people slaves. And in the morning... Some dead people that had been killed by the people that had come in to attack the Jewish nation. And friends, that's what happens in our life. When our walls are down, the devil is allowed to come in. I believe one of the reasons why we are facing the coronavirus today, and I believe that there'll be other attacks of the enemy that are coming in. Why? Because the walls of a good biblical foundation has been removed in many nations of the world. Christians are being persecuted. We don't hear very much reporting about the hundreds of Christians that are being killed in Nigeria and other African countries. You don't hear much about that, but it is happening today. And what is happening? The, 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 the nations of the world have passed laws that are contrary to the will of God. Political correctness comes against biblical standards and it's overrun this country. And that is why the devil's allowed to pillage Christians who are not living for God. They go to church on Sunday. They got a wonderful church building where they worship God. The people in Nehemiah's day had a wonderful temple they could go to. Listen to the word of God. Listen to the great rabbis of their day. But when they came out, the walls were down. Friends, we need to establish some good walls in our life. Because if we don't, the devil will come in and rob us out of everything. Steal our husbands, steal our wives, corrupt our children. 
bring people into bondage of alcohol, of drug addiction, and destroy the lives of many, many people. We need to build walls, what a wall of a good prayer life, walls of holiness, walls of standards. The trouble is today that people go to the temple, they go to the church, when they come out, they're no different to the ungodly. We are in the world, but not of the world. When I thought about this yesterday, I thought about a submarine. People that are in a submarine, they are surrounded by water. There is more sea than there is submarine. Around that submarine can be sharks and other poisonous fish. They are protected because they are in the submarine. The walls of that submarine protect them. They are in the water. They are in the sea, but the sea is not in them. Friends, we are in the world, but the world is not, should not be in us. In the world there is corruption. There is abomin abominable marriages that are taking place. There are sexual perversions all around us. There is murder. There is killing. There is blasphemy. But friends, we are in the world. But the world should not be in us. We are, we are to be a light to the world. But we need to have good standards of holiness. We need not only to have God in us. We need to have on the armour of God. So that in us and around us are the everlasting arms of God. We need to build up walls of a good prayer life, good regular Bible study, and living a holy and righteous life. Well, next week, on, in our next lesson, we are going to talk about the Ten Gates of Jerusalem. Let me remind you of the ten gates that are found in the book of Nehemiah. They are the sheep's gate, the fish gate, the old gate, the valley gate, the dung gate, the fountain gate, the water gate, the horse gate, the heath gate, and the inspection gate. And there is a lot of important, significant things that we can learn as a result of these gates because each one of us will come in from one of those gates at some time in our life and knowing how to get into those gates and what those gates represent will cause us to go from victory to victory. It will cause us to go from the gutter to the, to the uttermost. It will cause us to rise in our faith. So, get ready as we go into our next lesson sometime in the future on the, the Ten Gates of Jerusalem. Well, we've come to the end of this broadcast, which is just an introduction. And I know I took a little time doing it, and in order to help you understand the background of the book of Nehemiah, which is important, but please do your own study. Read the book of Nehemiah, and especially read Nehemiah chapter 3, because this will be significant to what we'll be teaching on. Well, remember the telephone number that you can call us on. If you have a prayer request, it's a WhatsApp number. You can phone me on the number, you can WhatsApp me, you can text me your prayer request. If you need counselling, we are there for you, because you are important to us. Well, we have come to the end of the broadcast, so tune in, watch this space, and get ready for part two. This is part one. Part two is coming shortly. God be with you till we meet again. Eternal life is a free gift from God. Jesus died for you. shall be saved cause God's free gift to you 
is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord.